Hey, hi, everybody. Um, we're going to get started now, although uh, I think we're still going to have people logging in. Um, but uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for joining us uh, for another Ecolab Dialogue. Uh, we're very pleased to have Elise Le Pongeon speaking today, um, and she's joined us via Zoom. Elise is a Paleolithic archaeologist who's interested in studying changes and persistence in human uh, technical behaviors, um, as shown through characteristics of stone tool uh, artifacts in Africa over the past 50,000 years. Elise uh, received her PhD in prehistory in 2013 from the French National Museum of Natural History in Paris. And she's cur currently a senior postdoctoral fellow uh, from the Research Foundation Flanders at the Department of Archaeology uh, of KU Levin in Belgium. Uh, Elise has provided the first talk uh, that we'll be hearing today discussing the role of the Nile Valley uh, during the late Pleistocene as a corridor of human movement. Uh, Kurt Rademacher is also joining us today, uh, and he's also here on Zoom to talk about the latest evidence of the initial human dispersals into the Americas. Kurt is an archeologist who investigates hunter-gatherer adaptation and human environmental interactions in Andean South America. He completed his PhD at the University of Maine in 2012, uh, and he's conducted postdoctoral research at the University of Tübingen, which is where I first met him. Uh, he's currently assistant professor, professor of, at Michigan State University, and he's led archaeological surveys and excavation projects throughout the US and Peru. He's also participated in field research on volcanic and glacial geomorphology. His current research is focused on the late Pleistocene to Middle Holocene and looks at settlement dynamics and biocultural adaptations in the high Andes. Kurt's talk is going to follow directly after Alice's, after which we'll have a question and answer session to hopefully create a dialogue between these two speakers. Uh, and you, the audience. Uh, if you have any questions for either specialist, please write them in the uh, group chat box, and I'll call on individuals to ask their questions after the talk. So thank you again to our speakers. Thank you to all of you for being here, and enjoy the talk. Hello, everyone. I would like first to thank very much Sarah and the CAREP team for inviting me to this dialogue series on migrations and dispersals, with the session today focusing on the late Pleistocene. I'll be talking in particular of the Nile Valley or Northeastern North Africa, which is a key region in Africa to consider when talking about dispersals, and in particular dispersals out of Africa. So much so that with this talk, I wanted to question this default role for the Nile Valley as a corridor by first briefly reviewing the evidence uh, that we have for dispersals during uh, the earlier Pleistocene and before focusing on the period at the end uh, of the Pleistocene. First, a few words on the geographical and environmental settings of the region. The Nile Basin is one of the largest uh, basins, river basins in the world and the longest uh, river on Earth. It extends from Lake Victoria south up to the Mediterranean. The main Nile has three main tributaries, so the main Nile starting uh, just north of Khartoum in Sudan uh, has three main tributaries, the Adbara and the Blue Nile that have their headwaters in the Ethiopian plateaus, and the White Nile with its headwater in the um, Great Rift Lakes, and in particular, the uh, Lake Victoria. This, uh, the northeastern Africa and the Nile Valley is an area of particular interest in African prehistory by its uh, geographic position, with the Nile geographically linking Africa south of the Sahara to the Mediterranean and through the hyper-arid Sahara. So to the only land bridge between Africa and Eurasia via the Nile Delta and the Sinai Peninsula. As such, it is one of the main routes out of Africa. 
We could indeed argue that most research in prehistory done in this region include aspects linked to the question of dispersals of hominins out of Africa. When we look, for example, at the available data for the first known dispersal of hominins out of Africa, we see that some of the oldest Homo erectus are present in the eastern Tokana region more than 1.85 million years ago, while the Dmanisi fossils in Georgia are dated to around 1.8 million years ago. So even if there are alternative routes, in quotes, out of Africa, Northeastern Africa and the Nile Valley are often considered as the most probable at that time. However, when we look at the available evidence from this region, there is very little evidence for the first phase of the earliest, uh, earliest Stone Age in Northeastern Africa, that is before one million years ago, or even before 500,000 years ago. Of course, this may not be evidence for absence, especially when we consider that there are very few stratified sites known for the earliest uh, Stone Age in the region, and that perhaps more than in other African regions, preservation of old archaeological uh, levels um, may be hampered by taxonomic processes or factor, but also because there is relatively less or a few little research intensity for the earliest uh, human occupation in this region than in other regions. However, there is also another perspective to consider, which is linked to the paleoenvironmental data that we have for this region and for the Nile in particular. As I was saying earlier, the Nile has three main tributaries. And it also has, so prior the main Nile, prior to the uh, building of the Aswan Dam, also had two um, main seasons, a dry season and a flood uh, season. During the flood uh, season, the main tributaries responsible for the Nile flow are the Adbara and the Blue Nile. While during the dry season, on the other hand, it is water coming from the White Nile that is responsible for keeping the main Nile flow. So while the drainage system of the Blue Nile and the Adbara is in place, uh, has been in place for at least uh, 10 million years, we know that the drainage system connecting Lake Victoria and the White Nile is fairly recent in geological times and date to around 500,000 years ago. This means that before 500,000 years ago, the Nile was probably a seasonal river that did not flow throughout the year, with potential consequences on human uh, occupation of this region and the role of this region as a corridor of dispersal. If we move forward in time, the Nile Valley and Northeastern Africa in general has also a prominent role in dispersals out of and back into Africa of Homo sapiens. Along with the so-called, of course, thousand route, in quotes, across uh, the Babel Mandab and into the Arabian Peninsula. Northeastern Africa acted as a potential, as a possible dispersal corridor for Homo sapiens during several phases. One is an MIS-5, so 130,000 years ago, and possibly earlier phase of expansion out of Africa, which is mainly uh, suggested by fossil evidence of Homo sapiens outside Africa. The next one is an MIS-4 phase of expansion out of Africa, suggested by genetic evidence, which, contrary to the earlier one, is considered as a successful one, if we can say that, because from this phase, all present-day human populations outside of Africa derive most of their ancestry. There is then some conflicting evidence, still based on genetic studies, for later, late Pleistocene back into Africa dispersals that may have uh, occurred via uh, the Nile Valley. In addition, it is worth to note that these phases of expansions took place in a context of strongly structured populations. Recent evidence invite, in, invites indeed 
to move away from a model of expansion based on dispersals from a specific point of origin in Africa, but rather to include more complex scenarios involving population structure. If we, however, look at the available evidence to evaluate hypotheses of dispersals out of or back into Africa via the Nile Valley or Northeastern Africa, it is clear that we have very little direct evidence. And by direct, I mean dated late Pleistocene human remains, as there is no late Pleistocene human ancient DNA uh, available uh, yet uh, in this region. And here I've put the main ones for the late Pleistocene, uh, in red and uh, for the very end of the place to see in, in blue. Other types of data can be used to evaluate hypotheses of dispersals through northeastern Africa, but in a more indirect way. Data that can be used as therefore environmental data and archaeological data. So I, I will be mostly drawing examples from studies that have investigated MIS-5 dispersals from Northeastern Africa, which is the, the dispersal phase that has triggered the most research in this area. So, um, because Northeastern Africa is a region characterized by arid environments, a way to tackle the dispersal question is to ask whether and when uh, was it possible, that is in terms of water availability, so when was it possible to go out of Africa from northeastern Africa. And here is an example from a recent paper by Beyer and colleagues that investigate these climatic windows and allow comparison um, between climatic windows along the northern uh, or the southern uh, route. Here, uh, another kind of uh, paleoenvironmental data it's a paleo map uh, by Felix Anzelowski and colleagues, uh, whom I thank for allowing me to include it uh, in this uh, presentation. So uh, with this map, uh, they use a combination of models, climatic data and geological data to investigate where and how dispersals in Egypt uh, could have occurred during MIS-5. So they take water availability into account as well as raw material availability in particular in terms of where flint uh, was available and here it's the hatched uh, zones that could show uh, the eastern desert rather than the uh, Nile Valley as potential uh, corridors. Based on archaeological data, a different question is asked, and uh, rather than and, and the issue is in the interpretation of similarities uh, in usually the lithic assemblages along the hypothetical routes uh, of dispersals. So that would be whether similarities could indicate technical diffusion. That would be. Um, that would be uh, relevant in the context of dispersals. So in uh, 1998, uh, Philip Van Peer explicitly in the context of out of Africa dispersals introduces a new uh, taxonomical entity, which he called the Nubian complex, uh, which is a techno complex. So the highest entity in archeological uh, taxonomy, which groups together assemblages presenting a certain level of similarity that would be consistent with the level of similarity expected on the scale at which dispersals occur. So since the introduction of the Nubian complex, which includes uh, the presence of Nubian uh, Levallois methods in its definition, uh, there has been some or many debates uh, around whether the presence of Nubian methods in different regions resulted from a technical diffusion in the context of out of Africa dispersals of Homo sapiens or independent innovation that is uh, converging. This touches upon a recurring problem in what can be called uh, the archaeology of dispersals, which is linked to the importance to reach a high enough chronological and spatial resolution uh, whether in uh, environmental data or in um, in archaeological data to um, 
balance the data more towards convergence or more towards uh, technical diffusion. For example, if we take a later phase of uh, the expansion of Homo sapiens out of Africa during MAS4, it corresponds to a period, let's say uh, MAS4 and, and 3, where the archaeological record is particularly sparse. So there is very little we can uh, discuss based on the archaeological data uh, to refer to dispersals um, through the Nile Valley on Northeastern Africa. Uh, in a certain extent, the same can be said for the proposed period for a later, late Pleistocene back into Africa dispersals, uh, a period where very few human remains are available. However, there are quite a large number of archaeological uh, uh, sites and data, and uh, this is what I would like to detail further in the following slides. The end of the late Pleistocene corresponds to the Upper Paleolithic and Late Paleolithic. So as I was saying, there are very few sites attributed to the Upper Paleolithic in Northeastern Africa, but for the end of the Pleistocene from 25,000 to 15,000 years ago, uh, which is the period that corresponds to the Late Paleolithic, many sites are known. Uh, they are located mostly in the Nile Valley and characterized by bladelet production and the toolkit where back pieces predominate. Uh, some sites uh, have yielded rich remains uh, that show that uh, the late variety corresponds to groups of uh, hunter-gatherer fisher societies. Before going into a little bit more details on the late uh, Paleolithic, I wanted to go back to the history of research in the area with the works of Jacques de Morgan and Edmond Vignard, as I think this may bring some interesting perspectives on how we see the prehistory of the region nowadays. So Jacques de Morgan went to Egypt at the end of the 19th century to be the director of the Antiquities Service. At the end of his stay, he wrote the pioneer work on the origins uh, of Egypt. In, the later pub in his later publications, he formulated a framework for the Egyptian prehistory, where he sees a long gap between the end of the Middle Paleolithic or Mousterian and the beginning of the Neolithic. So he doesn't see any Upper Paleolithic in Egypt, and uh, for him, this would have been caused by a major cataclysm in particular, major floods that would have hampered any human occupation in the area. So at the end of the 19th century, at the time that Jacques de Morgan uh, writes uh, his pioneer work, there is a major movement that rejects the previous model of a universal prehistory, which is a very linear development of the different phases of the Paleolithic, each characterized by one or two tool types, and uh, which was uh, incarnated by or personified by uh, Gabriel de Mortier. So Morgan rejects uh, strongly this model and instead is a proponent of regionalism, local developments, and is quite skeptical with the dispersal explanation to explain similarities in different regions. Edmond Vignard was trained in prehistory with Victor Comon in northern France. He arrived in Egypt as an engineer chemist for the sugar company Say, which was established in the Komombo region. He surveyed the area during his free time and uh, described industries that he sees as contemporary with the European Upper Paleolithic, but as developing locally from the local Mousterian in parallel to important ch changes in the environment. So the latest phase of this uh, progressively developing upper paleolithic from the local Mousterian would show uh, characteristics similar to European microlithic industries. And based on that, he formulated hypothesis that the Komombo region is where we can see the origins of all European microlithic industries. He even has this very uh, image uh, um, sentence where he says that the microburins and microliths would be the stones that the prehistoric Ansel and Gretel left on their way. 
So this is interesting as it integrates the idea of local development, but it shows dramatically opposed views with uh, Morgans, both in terms of the presence or absence of upper politics in the region, but especially we can see this as, uh, in the end, uh, the first debate on uh, diffusion against convergence in the Paleolithic of northeastern Africa. So I found this uh, very interesting to see that uh, debates that are ongoing now uh, really have their roots in uh, the early history of uh, research in the area. It's only with the intensive archaeological research that took place during the Nubia campaign in the 1960s and with the different campaigns, archaeological campaigns that followed, that many late Paleolithic sites were discovered located in uh, the Nile Valley. So what is the late Paleolithic in the Nile Valley? A few sites uh, have yielded well-preserved archaeological remains composed of rich lithic assemblages, as well as bone tools, preserved organic remains, which show uh, the presence of um, uh, various subsistence activities, such as uh, fishing activities with numerous fish bones, uh, bone tools that are interpreted in term, uh, in, uh, as fish hooks with probable structures um, in the presence of potholes uh, to uh, dry or smoke uh, fish and uh, grinding tools for probably grinding uh, plant tubers. But uh, um, human groups during the late Paleolithic were also hunters, uh, in particular from sites located uh, in the Komombo Plain that uh, also show evidence for uh, the hunt of uh, hippopotamus. The late Paleolithic is also associated with rock art, which is characterized by engraved uh, figures of large bovids, as well as uh, other animals and a few uh, human figures. And it has uh, OSL dates suggesting a date around 15,000 years ago and thus an association uh, with the late uh, Paleolithic. The end of the late Paleolithic is also associated with cemeteries, and here uh, one of the uh, best known is the Jebel Sahaba Cemetery that was excavated by the combined prehistoric expedition led by Fred Wendorf during the Nubia campaign, uh, with around uh, 60 individuals buried and most of them presenting traces of uh, interpersonal violence, either in the presence of embedded lithic fragments uh, in their bones or in the presence of uh, barry fractures. A recent study showed, uh, led by Isabel Krefker, showed that the cemetery of Jeber Sahaba likely represented several episodes of violence, so this was not a one-off uh, event. But what did the Nile look like during the late Paleolithic? It is difficult to answer this question because many, uh, even if many geological works took place in several parts of the Nile Valley that are figured here with colors and with the described uh, sequences uh, in summary here, um, the data are difficult to correlate so between uh, each uh, area of the Nile Valley for several reasons. What we know is that the general climate during MIS-2 or uh, between uh, during uh, the late Paleolithic was arid to hyperarid with very low precipitation uh, levels. At the other end of the Nile Basin, Lake Victoria was dry around 17,000 years ago, which means there was no overflow in the White Nile, which means that the Nile might not have been uh, perennial, but whether a seasonal river at that time. A reduced, a very reduced flow of the Nile is also confirmed by data from uh, cores uh, in the eastern uh, Mediterranean. There are two main models for the reconstruction of the Nile environments during uh, MIS-2 and the last glacial maximum in particular. The first one proposed by Romuald Shield and Fred Wendorf is that of a seasonal uh, braided river where human occupation would have been possible during the dry season around the pools uh, left on the uh, floodplain. 
The second one proposed by Pierre Vermersch and Wim van Nier is that of a lake environment. So wind activity would have led to dune advancement that would have dammed the reduced Nile at several locations along the Nile Valley, creating large lakes that would have formed ideal environments for human occupation. So what is sure is that human occupation was possible, at least at several locations uh, along the Nile Valley. When we look at the chronological and geographical distribution of the late Paleolithic archaeological sites, we see a few tendencies. The first one is the concentration of sites in the Nile Valley in southern Egypt and northern Sudan. But this corresponds to the intensive research in the Aswan region during the Nubian campaign and uh, the, the campaigns that followed. Similarly, when we look at the distribution of radiocarbon dates associated with late Paleolithic sites, this shows a peak around the last glacial maximum. This could be interpreted as a higher number of sites, and therefore people in the Nile Valley at that time, but half of the total number of dates, uh, of all radiocarbon dates associated uh, to the late Paleolithic, comes from one single complex of sites in Wadi Kubania. So this reflects more the intensity of research or of dating in this area than any archaeological reality. So even if the archaeological data corresponding to the late Paleolithic in the Nile Valley is very rich, its interpretation may be a little tricky given these biases. Taking that into account, we can now go back to the question of interactions between the Nile Valley and neighboring regions during MIS-2 in the context of potential back into Africa dispersals based on archaeological data. There were some hypotheses of interactions based on the fact that the Nile Valley, northwestern Africa and the Levant see the emergent of, emergence of bladelet-based industries around the same time at the beginning of MIS-2. However, you can notice the different names given to that phase of the end of the Paleolithic ibero morugian or later Stone Age in North Africa, Late Paleolithic in the Nile Valley, and Epipaleolithic in the Levant. This results from different research histories in each of these regions and is a consequence uh, of what, uh, sorry, and the consequence of that is that the data is hardly comparable between these regions in terms of research um, theoretical and methodological approaches too. In an attempt, to further investigate how similar these industries really are, beyond the fact that they all seem to be bladelet industries, a comparative study was undertaken between assemblages from the Nile Valley and assemblages from the Levant in the Negev Desert. This pilot study relied on two assemblages from sites located near Esna in Egypt that were excavated by the combined prehistoric expedition at the end of the 1960s and that, like most late Paleolithic sites that have been excavated at that time, uh, are now destroyed. You see the irrigation and urbanization uh, expansion here. Here is an example of what the material looks like, with one side, one assemblage, presenting small blade or large bladelet production from uni or bidirectional cores, and a toolkit composed of mostly large uh, truncations uh, sometimes made uh, using the microburing technique. The other assemblage shows flake and bladelet production from often quadrangular cores and some cores recalling uh, Levallois characteristics. Retouch tools are varied but show a high proportion of small uh, truncations and back tools that may take geometric forms. Here too, sometimes made using the microburing technique. When these data are compared with data from the Epipaleolithic from the Levant, and this is a study made in collaboration with Nigel Goring Morris, differences between assemblages and especially between the Nile Valley and Levantine assemblages are striking. Here are some examples of technological characteristics, such as the preparation of the striking platform, uh, score uh, patterns, core types, and core management types. Uh, that are all different between sites, but especially between uh, the Nile Valley sites and the Levantine sites, which are the three at the top. 
Uh, these differences are even greater when looking at typological criteria with the intensive use of the microbrewing technique and high standardization of the toolkit in the Levantine and epipaleolithic, so here, compared to the late paleolithic of the Nar Valley, even if we consider the same uh, tool classes. In sum, this shows that similarities between the Nar Valley and the Levant, at least based on this small sample, are very superficial and that there is no clear indication of technical contacts between the Nar Valley and adjacent areas based on lithic characteristics, again based uh, on this uh, small sample. I also to, wanted to mention another hypothesis of interactions between the Nile Valley and other regions at that time, based on another kind of evidence, this time rock art. So this is based on one of the rock art sites from the late Paleolithic in Kurta, in the Komombo region, that shows human figures with a style that is very similar to what is known as Gonensdorf type human figures in the late Magdalenian of Western Europe. A similar type of figure is also known from an undated cave in the Sinai Peninsula. And based on the fact that they present a similar chronological range, this led uh, Dirk Hugo to propose the hypothesis that it may represent a dispersal out of Africa. But of course, further data is necessary to support this hypothesis. But what happens, uh, what does happen uh, towards the end of the late Paleolithic in the Nile Valley? So the beginning of MIS-1, around 15,000 years ago, shows the return of humid conditions, especially in Eastern Africa, which is sometimes called the African humid variant. This means that uh, Lake Victoria fills again and overflows in the White Nile, and this creates catastrophic floods downstream, which were called the Wild Nile by Butson. This must have led to an abrupt environmental changes that were linked uh, to the evidence for interpersonal violence at the end of the Pleistocene, such as the one documented in Jebel Sahaba. And this is further reinforced by the fact that there is almost no evidence for human occupation in the Nar Valley at the Pleistocene Holocene transition. But the exact impact of these environmental changes at the end of the Pleistocene is difficult to evaluate in the absence of evidence, especially taking into account uh, the, the, the biases of the data available. Here, as a side note, I just wanted to mention that this catastrophic event seems like an echo of Jacques de Morgan's idea that human occupation of the Nile Valley had ended somewhat abruptly because of what he called the cataclysm. The consequences of this environmental change at the Pleistocene Holocene transition are even more important to consider when we look at the study by Cooper and Croplin that was published a few years ago, and that shows that with the return of humid conditions in the Sahara, the Sahara rest of the Nile Valley is very quickly reoccupied at the beginning of the Holocene, while the Nile Valley is almost devoid of human occupation. This raises the question of where populations reoccupying the Sahara at the beginning of the Holocene were coming from. So was it from the Nile Valley or from uh, somewhere else? So was it... Um, In conclusion, this brief presentation started from the fact that there is a current narrative seeing the Nile Valley or Northeastern Africa as a dispersal corridor, and that humans must have gone out of Africa from this region at some point, and presumably at many points in time in the past. But there is very little archaeological evidence for that, in particular due, in particular due to the limitations of the data and its relatively low resolution. This is not to say that the region did not play a role in these vessels, not at all, but that perhaps the, paradoxically the region may have uh, suffered from its evident role as a dispersal corridor and that we may gain new insights into focusing on more regional questions, such as how interactions took place between the Nile Valley and immediately adjacent deserts. It is in this perspective that we published this collaborative book edited together with May Goder Goldberger and David Plordeau and chose to give it the title Not Just a Corridor, 
precisely to question the role of Northeastern Africa in its wider microregional context and not always through the prism of dispersals. So I thank you very much for your attention and I will leave you now with Kurt Rademacher's talk and I look forward to the Q&A session afterwards. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to thank all the organizers, especially Sarah Rhodes and uh, of course co-presenter Alice Laplongeon. Um, so I want to talk about dispersal in the late Pleistocene in the Americas. This is an equal area map of the Western Hemisphere. The Americas constitute about a third of Earth's inhabited continental land mass. Their settlement by people at the end of the Pleistocene constitutes the largest single aerial dispersal in our species history. In terms of human biogeographic expansions, what's different about the settlement of the Americas? It was geographically extensive, a whole hemisphere with considerable latitudinal and altitudinal range and biotic diversity. Biogeographic colonization happened only one time and only involved modern humans, so all lands were empty and unknown when people arrived there. Colonization appears to have been extremely rapid, happening in less than 3,000 years, and it included biocultural adaptation in every habitable environment. Study of this dispersal allows us to see what our species was capable of following previous global expansions and following the last glacial maximum. This is Beringia, the landmass connecting Siberia with Alaska during the last glacial maximum. It does not show the uh, ice masses at this time, but the lowered sea level and the exposed land along the continental margins is shown. And I want to point out that the youngest archaeological site in western Beringia or Siberia is the Yana rhinoceros horn site here uh, 32,000 years ago. And the oldest site in Alaska is Swan Point, here at 14,400 years ago. And what happened between 32,000 years ago and 14,400 years ago is a bit of a mystery, with uh, no archaeological sites found in the intervening area and in the intervening time. Uh, there appears to have been a period of standstill, the Beringian standstill, um, before humans expanded into the rest of continental Americas. What was one of the reasons this standstill took place? This map shows a ice sheet model output from the University of Maine, where uh, ice 14,000 years ago is shown. So we have here the Laurentide ice sheet, the large ice mass over most of continental Canada, and the Cordilleran ice sheet over the Canadian Rocky Mountains this mass here. And these ice sheets grew and coalesced um, near the last glacial maximum, maybe 24,000 years ago. And this ice coalescence is what kept people out of uh, territory to the south for, for quite a while, even after they crossed into Alaska from Siberia. This is what that ice sheet might have looked like. It's probably our best analog and this is the West Antarctic ice sheet. So this would have been impassable to human travel. The earliest reliable North American sites in the continent date to between about 15 and 13,000 years ago. Throughout this talk, I'm gonna use Ka as thousands of calibrated years before present. There are earlier claims for sites in North America and in South America, but in this talk, I'm going to uh, focus on those sites that ar most archaeologists accept as indicating a reliable human presence, and I'm going to omit sites uh, that significantly predate uh, these and that archaeologists are, are not in agreement on, that, that are highly controversial. Those include things like uh, the Saruti Mastodon site that was about 120,000 years old, a uh, recent purported pre-last glacial maximum site in Mexico, or the brand new discovery of purported pre-LGM human footprints at White Sands, New Mexico. And I'll get to why I'm omitting those in, in just a little bit. However, even among the sites shown, not one of these is free of controversy. There's vigorous debate on dating and contextual issues on all of them. Um, if we look at them, we've got Paige Ladson here in Florida, 
the Deborah Friedkin site here in Texas, Paisley Cave in Oregon, and Cooper's Ferry also in Oregon. Why didn't American archaeologists worry so much about scrutinizing uh, every site to, to the nth degree? In the Americas, settlement models are constructed from relatively few data points, few archaeological sites, limited fossil records, and very few records of ancient DNA. So different researchers maintain varying standards for accepting evidence as valid. Because of the very small span of time in which all of the dated events are transpiring, whether a site is accepted or not, whether it's included in dispersal models or not, completely changes the story. The timing of the earliest colonization, the rate of movement of people or the spread of technology, the route or routes used in the earliest dispersal, and by extension, the type of adaptation that is considered the earliest. This map shows cosmogenic exposure age dates for the ice recession of the western margin of the Cordilleran ice sheet here and the ice-free corridor between the Cordilleran and Laurentide ice sheets, this area here. And in the graph to the left, those cosmogenic ages are plotted uh, with respect to the four archaeological sites I just described to you. And um, the blue squares are the margin of the West Cordilleran ice sheet, and the brown squares are the ice-free corridor. And exposure age dates are showing us when ice pulled back from that position, and that date corresponds to that area being exposed by recently retreating ice. So what's clear here is that, and this is from a paper that just came out last month in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, What's clear here is that the western margin of the Cordilleran ice sheet opens earlier than the ice-free corridor does. And only the western margin of the Cordilleran ice sheet can account for all of the archaeological, all of these four archaeological sites that are documented in North America and dated to this time frame between about 16 and 14,000 years ago. Whereas the interior ice-free corridor does not open until about 15 to 14,000 years ago, which is too late for, to account for the earliest evidence in North America. So this would indicate that the earliest southward dispersals from Alaska must have occurred along the coast rather than through the interior. This would imply navigation along a re recently deglaciated coastline by boat, uh, illustrated in genetics publications like the one here with this route. <clears throat> the route would have involved boating between ice-free refugia where biotic resources were available. The Umiak, shown in the photo in the lower left, shows the kind of boat that would have been used in such dispersals. These are uh, boats that are Hide-covered boats, these are the hides of marine mammals that the Inuit have used. Um, and yet, when I look at this Umiak with their dogs and all their stuff in there, it, the idea that you would float down uh, along the western margin of the Cordilleran Ice Sheet, recently deglaciated coastline, past calving uh, glaciers between refugia, that, that idea is pretty daunting to me. However, if this route happened, if this was used this way, this would Im might imply maritime adaptation, though some terrestrial resources would also have been necessary. However, an even more recent ge glacial geologic study suggests that the Cordilleran ice sheet west margin extended onto the continental shelf until 15,000 years ago, with Pacific coast refugia not available until that time. This timing would suggest that both the interior ice-free corridor and Pacific coast routes open near simultaneously, and therefore either route could account for archaeological sites in continental North America after 15,000 years ago. Now, I think this example illustrates how dynamic our field is, with two geochronologic papers reaching contradictory conclusions published within a few weeks of each other, only within the past month. What do genomics have to add to this picture? Genomic studies using uh, 
ancient archaeological and modern genomes of living indigenous populations provide some key age estimates on divergence times of mitochondrial and Y chromosome lineages. The graph shown on the left is from Yamas et al. 2016. This plots mitochondrial lineage diversification after 16,000 years ago with a 75% confidence interval between 15 and 13,000 years ago. Native American founder lineages are shown here as colored dots, and then the lineage diversification is shown in here in all of these, uh, all of these, um, this, de this dendrogram here. Various studies looking at the Y chromosome phylogenies indicate entry to North America from Siberia at or after 15.3 to 14.3 Ka or 17.7 .7 to 14.3 Ka. <clears throat> and a third study using the Y chromosome uh, QM848 shows a rapid star-like radiation at 14.9 Ka. So I think it's remarkable that, uh, that all of these age estimates are lining up so well with each other, considering that the, uh, they're using separate samples, they're using different uniparental markers, um, and yet we're getting a pretty consistent um, age of great diversification and population increase between 15 and 14,000 years ago. The driver for the expansion is believed to be people reaching the vast empty land masses south of the continental ice sheets. And the dramatic nature of this dispersal event is reflected on the quote provided by Panati et al. here. With this QM848 lineage, probably the largest scale and most rapid demographic expansion in human history after the Out of Africa event, identified by the CTM168 lineage ancestral to all non-African Y chromosomes which is a nice point of comparison with, between this talk and analysis talk. Bringing these data sets together, um, is there consistency? The archaeology is consistent with a dramatic uh, expansion in population after 16 or 15,000 years ago. There's a dramatic increase in archaeological site visibility in North America and continental North America by 13,000 years ago. The Clovis culture was the earliest widespread cultural phenomenon. And there was another very large widespread phenomenon in the West called Western Stemmed. These are named after their respective projectile points. And this map on the left shows the Paleo-Indian database of the Americas archive of fluted points found in continental North America, which shows a truly continental scale um, distribution of, of sites that likely date to 13,000 years ago. Very few of them actually have been dated to with uh, radiocarbon dates. A post 15,000 year old timing of expansion in North America is also indicated, or at least it's consistent with the earliest burials and, burials and ancient genomes in North and Central America. This paper pre, um, presented the genome from the Anzic child from the state of Montana, which established a direct link with Siberia and a link with this ancient genome in modern indigenous Americans. So the Anzic genome came from the fragmentary remains of an infant male child directly below over 100 Clovis artifacts and covered with red ochre, and it was directly dated to about 13,000 years ago. Uh, before I move on, I should add that um, any purported archaeological evidence from North or South America that predates 16,000 years ago cannot be reconciled with glacial geologic data constraining the opening of corridors south of the ice or with genomic data from ancient or modern people, unless those archaeological sites represent failed migrations that did not leave any descendants detected to date in genomic studies. Now moving to South America. Here, uh, we also have a few sites that are, that are anomalously early. There are earlier ones that have been claimed, though especially the oldest ones claimed back 20, 30,000 years, they all have um, some seri pretty serious unresolved problems. But even these four earliest sites that are considered reliable 
are not universally accepted by archaeologists because of various issues. If any of these pre-13,500 year old sites from South America are real, this would imply extremely rapid southward movement of colonizing groups, coeval with or even predating Clovis in North America. Um, and especially if, uh, if 15,000 years is, is accurate for the age of arrival here, this, this would be near simultaneous arrival uh, in South America from groups that um, from that just recently diverged in, in North America. Arrival in Peru and Southern Chile by 14,000 years ago would imply a maximum travel time of less than a thousand years after expansion south of the North American continental ice sheets as indicated by the genetic studies. Or these would indicate one or more earlier failed migrations that did not leave any genetic descendants. One problem that archeologists struggle with is that if one or even all of these earlier sites are real, it would imply that archeologists throughout South America and maybe the entire Western hemisphere have been missing most of the earliest archeological evidence despite searching for it for over 70 years. If the pre 13,500 year old sites are simply the result of geofacts or errors in chronology association or site formation, and instead a shorter chronology is true, how much shorter is it? By 13,500 to 11,500 years ago, there seems to be a robust occupational signal in various environments indicated by archeology. span But this is a pretty big slice of time when you consider um, how many sites there are and that they don't all date to the same time. When are the earliest reliable sites where are they and is there a coherent order of settlement of different areas? To answer this, these questions requires um, finer time slices and greatly improved chronologies in South America. So shifting to a slightly different map this, that plots all South American sites dated between 13,000 and 11,000 years ago. Um, and the calibration curve on the left shows a plateau in this age range that makes precise dating very difficult. So here's that plateau. And this tends to uh, make sites within this range broadly contemporary or appear contemporary. <clears throat> I need to mention that the majority of terminal Pleistocene sites in South America are not well dated. Many sites have only single dates Sometimes the material dated isn't identified. That's often the case. There are stratigraphic inconsistencies with many of the early site chronologies. There are poor associations between data material and artifacts. And maybe most troublesome, there are unresolved old wood effects and impossible to quantify marine reservoir effects on dated samples. If a shorter chronology is true, it implies that the oldest sites in South America would post-date the earliest ones in North America, as would be expected in a progressive north to south dispersal episode. But either longer or shorter chronologies imply rapid dispersal and landscape learning processes, because non-controversial sites are in all major eco-regions of South America by 12,000 years ago, even in some of the most extreme environments. Resolving the timing of the earliest sites in each specific eco-region is important for understanding processes of dispersal and landscape learning. If the order of settlement of different ecoregions could be determined, this could indicate the primary routes of dispersal, since we have almost no clear evidence on this from North America or Central America. Now I want to shift a little bit to a different scale question. We So far we've been talking about whole continents, but what if we bring come down to the, the regional level? and ask a, a, a simple question, or a, a, an apparently simple question, which area was settled first, um, the Pacific coast or the Western, or the Andean highlands in Western South America? And specifically, I wanna look at a couple of sites here in this, red, in this red square. This is an area where my team's been working extensively over the last decade, so I know this area well. Here's one of those sites, Quebrada Hawaii in southern Peru is considered one of the earliest coastal sites in the Americas. 
The site was dated between 13,000 and 11,400 years ago, so the site could be the same age as Clovis or a little bit later. Um, it was located about eight kilometers from the Paleo shoreline, and the faunal remains in this site are 100% marine, including sea bass, crustaceans, and mollusks. So at first, Quebrada Hawaii appears to represent um, a possible, possible support for a maritime migration or a coastal route um, to settle South America. However, um, there are materials in this site that do not come from the coast, and those include petrified wood. These come from 30 kilometers to the north, which is up this canyon. Um, prickly pear cactus seeds. These come from the highlands as well, in the same direction to the north there. And down here on the bottom, Alca obsidian from a source called Alca, which is located 150 kilometers north up in the Andes. Because these interior resources occur at the very start of occupation of this coastal site, these suggest that the, uh, that the colonization process here is a little more complicated than simply people moving down the coast. This implies some connection with the interior or perhaps an origin in the interior, or perhaps that there are others in the interior that people here on the coast are interacting with. I also mentioned a revision of the Quebrada Hawaii chronology. After um, revisiting this site and redating this site using accelerator mass spectrometry, our team revised the, the chronology of the site to about 12,000 years old to 11,000 years old. Uh, and it looks like some of the old dates, many of the old dates were obtained on old wood which is a real problem here on this hyper-arid coastline. And basically that problem is that uh, prior to the arrival of the very first people on the South American coast, you could have had dead trees sitting around um, usable on the landscape. And when those first people arrived and made campfires, they were burning trees that were hundreds, many hundreds of years old, possibly up to a thousand years old. Um, this is one of the driest deserts in the world. So that's possible here and our dates seem to confirm it. And if that's true here, it might be true at other coastal sites as well. So our team used the presence of Alca Obsidian to look for an additional related Pleistocene site in the interior near that source of Obsidian. And we found that those sites in the Pacuncho Basin, which is where the Obsidian from, uh, that ended up at Quebrada Hawaii uh, originated from. Now that obsidian cannot reach the coast by any natural means. It can't be brought down by rivers or volcanic eruption or anything else. There's only one way to get that obsidian down to the coast, and that's if people uh, brought it there with them or exchanged it down to the coast. In the Kuncho Basin, our team found a couple of Pleistocene sites, a workshop, the Pukuncho open air site that contained fishtail and fluted projectile point bases, and these points are all, always date between 12,900 and 12,200 years ago. And this implied that people were here in this basin at the same time or earlier than they were at Quebrada Hawaii. We also discovered Kunkaicha Rock Shelter. Kunkaicha Rock Shelter, where our team excavated from 2010 to 2015, has an incredible occupation sequence. Its initial occupation spanned 12,300 to 11,100 years ago, based on a lot of AMS dates on ultra-filtered and X8A purified faunal bone collagen. The site contains a very rich sequence with lots of material, including stone and bone tools, bone beads and ochre, kilograms of debitage, many kilograms of faunal remains, paleobotanical remains, and anthropogenic sediments. This site is also just as old or older than Quebrada Hawaii. Kukaicha's early residents hunted local animals. These include the Andean wild camelids, Vicuña and Wanaco, the large rodents, Viscacha, and the Andean deer, Taruga. They used local lithic raw materials, plants, and fuel. They deposited dense materials from the start of their occupation. And the activities indicated by the assemblages include combustion and food consumption, hide working, stone and bone tool production and bead crafting. I'll show you some artifacts from that site. This is an archaeology talk after all. 
There are camelid and deer bone tools shown on the left and on the right, a small sample of the many bifacial and unifacial stone tools. All of these, or nearly all of them, are made on local obsidian, dacite, jasper, and chalcedony. And in terms of the crafting, um, we see bone production. So there are bone, bone beads at various stages of manufacture. And we see ochre. And these are, these are, um, are really interesting and suggest that people are spending some quantity of time here, probably in a residential camp. Um, all resources found at Kumkaicha were obtained within 40 kilometers of the site, and most were obtained within five of the site. This is indicated by um, GIS modeling or uh, GIS mapping of all of the different resources that have been found in Kunkaicha and tracing those resources to their likely origin points on the landscape. No resources come from below 3,500 meters elevation. So what we're looking at here is a completely highland um, foraging strategy. It looks like Kunkaicha perhaps was a central place where resources from the surrounding highlands were brought in um, probably to a residential base that was seasonally occupied. We see no evidence that Kunkaicha was settled from the coast. No coastal resources whatsoever are here. This is important and this is special because this implies that because Kunkaicha is one of the world's highest elevation Pleistocene sites that people were actually living in high elevations for periods of time all the way back at the, at the end of the Pleistocene. But Kunkaicha is not the only one. If we, if we come back out to a continental scale, we see 24 terminal Pleistocene sites in the Andes dated between 12,700 and 11,000 years, years ago. And um, part of this might be due to the fact that the Andes are incredibly resource rich. Despite their challenges, despite the fact that the, it's cold at night in the Andes, and then it's cold every night of the year in the Andes, and despite the fact that um, of hypoxia, low oxygen pressure, um, the resource density in the Andes far exceeds anything else you can get on the western slope of the Andes or the Pacific coast for that matter. And unlike the Pacific coast, Fresh water is uh, available and abundant in all locations uh, all year round. The density and similarity of resources throughout the Andean range has led some, uh, uh, some colleagues to suggest that the Andes themselves uh, were, uh, acted as a mega patch, an area of, of similar enough resources and resource structure that when initial colonizing groups came into the Andes, perhaps in the north in Colombia, where the Andes were lower, they would have learned these resources. And once those resources and their structure were learned, that knowledge could be applied in movement throughout the entire Andean range where, where those resources and resource structures are broadly similar. The Andes as a colonization corridor may have also been aided by the Central Andean pluvial episode, whose ages correspond perfectly with the ages of the initial settlement of the Andes. The Central Andean pluvial episode is a time of increased rainfall and strengthened South American monsoon conditions indicated by higher lake levels and a number of other paleoclimate proxy records dating to this time period. Ultimately, what it's going to take to resolve whether the coast, the highlands, or both were initial colonization routes into South America will be more work. But genomics can also inform on our knowledge of what's going on here too. In this study that was published in 2018 using 49 ancient genomes, um, Post and colleagues identified the earliest genomes in South America on the Pacific coast at Los Rieles, Chile, and in the Brazilian interior at Lapo do Santo. Both of these earliest genomes had affinity to the Anzic child in North America, in the interior. And I think it's interesting to point out that one of the two Anzic genomes in South America was at a coastal site, Los Rieles. I also think it's interesting that the Anzic affinity is, is shown on both sides of the continent here, indicating um, perhaps a bifurcation of populations after exiting 
the, the Panamanian Isthmus and populations moving both down the Atlantic and Pacific sides of the continent, though the, though the specific routes are unknown. The study also identified as a distinct ancestry that appears at the earliest 9,000 years ago at Kunkaicha, the site I just told you about. This is a, a different ancestry stream. And third, another distinct ancestry stream appears at Kunkaicha in the, in the Andean Highlands about 4,200 years ago for the first time. And I think what's interesting about this is that is the affinity of this genome with, um, with others from the California Channel Islands. Again, we're seeing similarity in a very high elevation population and in South America and a, a low elevation um, coastal population in North America, sort of the flip of um, the ANZIC interior genome um, being present at the Pacific coast in South America. So the earliest genomes are indicating no clear separation of coast and highland lineages as, as being distinct. Instead, there seems to be some exchange going on between those two things that we think of as being distinct. What is the implication of this for dispersal routes? More ancient samples should help us, us resolve what's going on, but um, certainly there's an awful lot that we have to learn about what's going on with uh, early dispersals into the Americas. Thanks very much for being here and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much to both of our speakers uh, for some really interesting talks. Uh, do we have any uh, questions? I see Anna from the ESET Up Dialogue team has her hand up already. Anna? I was clapping, but I have questions. <laughs> uh, well, I have a, a question for Elise, but also for Kurt, because I think, well, we can talk about both both thoughts on this. Elise, you were talking about the interpersonal violence during the late Pleistocene of these populations. Is this violence related to intergroup conflicts or more related to climate, uh, these strong climate conditions that produce this obligation to, to fight against other groups to survive? And if it was the case, do we have evidence of that in the northern area or in the during the MIS-1 tour or not? Thank you for the for the question. Um, well, in that uh, study with the recent uh, paper published by uh, Isabel Krefker Riggs, uh, the problem with the Jebel Sahaba site is that we have one cemetery at the same location that was uh, showing like recurrent episodes of violence, but uh, I don't think we have the data yet to to really define whether it was different groups. Um, or not uh, fighting uh, between each other. I think that's very difficult to say based on, on the data. And even if I find the hypothesis of linking uh, violence to uh, competition for resources uh, that would be uh, triggered by these uh, environmental changes that we know uh, occurred at, the, uh, at that time, around that time, if we if we, there is also a bit of uncertainty uh, of the dating also of, the, of that cemetery. So it's a, I feel that we don't have the data yet to really associate uh, environment uh, in a causal uh, way, environmental changes with interpersonal violence. And there might be other uh, reasons for that, I think. Okay, and sorry. And yeah. also, to, well, I would also ask to Kurt if, we have any evidence of this kind of violence somewhere in America related to that? Um, so there are there is some evidence of of violent death among some of the the earlier early Holocene burials. Pleistocene burials are very rare. Um, one in Central America in Oil Negro, Mexico. Uh, it looks like a young a young girl 
suffered a violent death, but it doesn't look like a vi uh, violence by another person. It seems like she had an accident and fell into a, a sinkhole. But in South America, there are some of the early Holocene burials I'm aware of from the Pampas region do have projectiles embedded in their thoracic skeletons, suggesting either uh, hunting accidents or, or, or some interpersonal violence. I see. I see. Nora Franco is here, and maybe she could knows even better what what the evidence is like there. Okay. Thank you, and thank you, you both, for these amazing talks. Okay. Thank you, Anna, for that great question. Um, I believe Katharina has her hand up. We're going to go to her next. Yes. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for the for the both presentations. Very interesting. I have a question for Kurt. Uh, I myself is I'm a master's student at the University of Montreal, and I'm working on the peopling of the Americas by by doing a um, geo modeling on ArcGIS on uh, in Beringia, specifically. And I just wanted to get your opinion on what you think about the um, these controversial sites in. Um, Yukon and Alaska, uh, more specifically with bluefish caves um, and these two paleo uh, environmental sites, Lake uh, Bureau Lake and Lake E5, if you've heard of them. Yeah, I have heard of them and I, I omitted them from, from my talk, but I maybe I shouldn't have. So in terms of the, I, I guess I'd like to say something about the lakes first. Um, and correct me if I, if I misrepresent anything or get something wrong. Um, I believe the evidence for human presence around the lakes has something to do with, um, with is that with coprostanols? Am I right about that? Yeah, I think yeah, here exactly. we're, I think there, there, there are some omnivore, omnivore coprostanols that have been found in lake sediments. And they're argued to have been, humans are argued to be the omnivores responsible and I think one of the issues there, and I think these are quite early, pre-LGM, does that science seem right? I think the problem there is that there's, there's um, that's the only evidence, there's no habitation evidence nearby that, that, that lake sediment evidence connects with, but there's also, um, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little um, skeptical because I think other omnivores may be, may be able to produce the same, um, the same, signal uh at least that's that's something i've considered yeah but Trula and his but Trula, i don't know if i'm pronouncing his name right and his team have also uh proposed that maybe these um fecal ma markers as uh, as he's mentioned them um could have been used to start fires because there are uh, evidence of there's charcoal remains apparently in uh, lake e5 that and and environmental data does not support a theory of natural fires in that area at that time. I think that would be really exciting for, uh, and that team should get a grant and do a giant survey in that area and find the archeological sites. And, and in, in terms of the um, bluefish caves, uh, I mean, I have to mention that Siberia and Alaska are so little explored for archeological evidence. Um, so I would welcome anybody doing more work on this topic. Um, in terms of bluefish caves, I think there are some, there are some issues with, with um, arguing from cut marks on bones that are selected from an enormous uh, assemblage of bones without cut marks and that they span a, a really, really long period of time and that there aren't other human artifacts that go with them. So there, there's sort of a site formation hang up that I think I, I have with those with that particular evidence. And um, that, that's why I, I, I didn't mention it. Um, certainly there's no issue though with there being last glacial maximum sites in Alaska. I just didn't think that that evidence was particularly strong. Got it, thank you. Okay, thank you, Katharina, for your question, and Kurt for a great answer. I actually have a question for both uh, speakers, a little bit broad, but um, tied into what Kurt just said about the need for more research in, uh, in Alaska, in the LGM. 
you both mentioned in your talks um, how a part of the patterns we're seeing in terms of migrations in these regions is due to uh, research history-based biases. Um, could you both um, discuss or, or give us an idea of how you would like to see archaeologists address these research-based biases? Where should we be looking for sites or what sites should we be re-looking at um, to better contextualize them? Uh, maybe Kurt wants to go first since he's nodding so much. That, that's a great question. And that was something I was thinking about during Elise's talk the whole time. Um, I, was, I was going to ask something similar, but you beat me to it. So I would love to see, uh, I would love to see more work in the Andean highlands, but especially in Colombia near the point of entry to the continent. And I, I know, I know some teams are working there, but it's hard to uh, it's hard to um, communicate how few teams are working on early settlement in in Western South America and how how large the the landmass is and and how remote many of the field areas are. And I, I think what one thing we really do need in archaeology is more survey projects. This is something that is is difficult to get funded through grant agencies because it's risky. But we 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 desperately need to get out into empty landscapes and and do more surveying work. Great, thank you, Elise. Yes, I absolutely agree with that. And 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 for the the for northeastern Africa, so both Egypt and Sudan, considering its potential, like really important role in dispersals out of Africa of Homo sapiens, but even earlier. It's really uh, frustrating to see so little research in that area uh, as a whole. So it has many reasons, but for example, uh, in Egypt, there hasn't been any Paleolithic work in the last 10 years or so, or maybe just one or two uh, field projects. And then, um, and then in Sudan, there are a few ongoing projects, but it's, I, I would say it's, it's not enough. So, and it's been uh, focused as well uh, in the Nile Valley, and I, I would say that we would need more data from the from the um, outside of the Nile Valley as well. So yes. <laughs> okay, great. Lots of uh, great ideas for the younger researchers joining us today. Um, I see that Vera has her hand up. It's either Vera or Godfwa. Not sure which. Okay, Godfwa, <laughs> you have a question. Yes, actually, it's me. Hello. Uh, no, really, thanks a lot for those really nice talks. Um, what, uh, again, I'm, I'm not really a very good uh, archaeologist, so my questions perhaps is a bit uh, uh, abnormal. But what I, what I was surprised is to see how the difference between the amount of time to pass this tiny space in uh, Northeast Africa, and we are talking about tens of thousands of years and go, and then uh, in America, it seems to go so fast. And then there is all the chunk in between that we didn't talk about. Uh, do we have any idea, do we have any quantification of how fast we can migrate in, uh, in landscape? Why sometimes, I mean, I understand that when there is a sea, it's, it's harder to pass, but do we have any idea of how fast we go normally? Sorry, I don't know to whom it should be more directed, but why, why do you have such different timings, different speeds? Well, I think Kurt's talk uh, really explored, at least to me, the, the really uh, fast speeds that we move the groups moved into uh, South America. So maybe you can start with that. Why did people move so quickly through the Americas, do you think, compared to the Nile Valley or other regions? That's a really hard question to answer. I think, I think that's one of the hardest questions of all. Uh, I remember reading a while ago uh, something about, it was a, ba a basic idea that if you're moving into an empty landscape where people are, uh, the resources become depressed and, they're, and so the resources ahead of where people are 
will always be more numerous than where people have already been. And, in, and so it's like a pump that continuously has people moving forward. I don't think it's population pressure from the back so much as it is uh, the lure of resources and, and, and the, uh, the opportunity of space ahead, at least if people have the abilities. And I think the people in the Americas were, were looking at the kind of the culmination of abilities for homo sapiens. And so uh, after sitting through the last glacial maximum, I think after an ordeal like that, I think people would um, move, southward movement would be inevitable if that was allowed. And, and I think that's part of what explains how, how fast people moved. Okay, so like a resource pump as compared to a culture pump or something like that. That's, right. that's an interesting idea, right. yeah. Um, Elise, uh, would you say that, uh, you know, maybe people move more slowly uh, in the Nile Valley because there were less resources or just because they weren't in boats or what would be your theory? Well, I don't know if, if we can say that they moved more slowly uh, because there wasn't any sea, but there was a there was a desert that was quite a, um, ex extended during the arid uh, uh, period. So, but I don't know. It gives the impression it was fast, but maybe it's more because we are focusing on 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 climatic windows where only in our own way of uh, viewing things that it was possible to pass and then have the impression then that when it was possible it was very fast but I don't think we have again the data to really uh, to really see how fast or how slow this was and I agree this is a very difficult question <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah and maybe when if but hopefully when we get those better time slices, we'll have a better idea of the, of the speed in, in, on both continents um, yes. that people move. And, and also maybe um, also maybe data from the, the genetic data seem to, to say that it was fast uh, processes. But I think that as archaeologists, uh, we need to take into account the genetic data, but also consider that Genetic data gives only one uh, part of the scenario and that uh, there is a lot of things that we don't know and that uh, maybe with accumulation of archaeological data we'll be able to solve like such those, such as this like uh, failed uh, dispersals that is now uh, that appears more in the archaeological data than actually the successful one in northeastern Africa. I think it gives a lot of food for thought to see how genetic and archaeological data can be put together to really discuss a general narrative about dispersals in the region. That's a really interesting point that, yeah, we might be misreading the data and actually looking at some failed uh, group movements um, at the same time. Thank you. Um, we have two questions from Ruli Fuzi. Um, do you want to ask them directly? Uh, no, my, my connection is terrible now, but can you hear me clearly? Okay, okay I sorry. can hear you, yes. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Good afternoon, I'm Ruli from Indonesia. And my question is for Ali, your presentation. Uh, Paleolithic of North Africa is completely new subject for me, and it is... Uh, it's thousand kilometers from Indonesia, so I, it's completely uh, subject of uh, the presentation. My question is: uh, first question is regarding the availability of uh, and numbers of lithic assemblage in New Valley, both for its spatial and temporal distribution. Is it possible to clearly define whether is it related to technological development or technological adaptation? simply just differentiation on site function each site uh, scattered in along the uh, Nil Valley and then the second one is uh, comparing technological similarity on western and eastern lithic assemblage seems perfect, like I saw from your presentation but how far is it possible to do 
to some degrees, we un sometimes we understand different types of regional landscapes or, or resources or even ideologies might cause a completely different. Okay. What do you think about this I idea? Holy anymore? View? Oh, it's my connection. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. you did cut anyway, I, a I little bit, really. Sorry. Um, so I posted your questions in the group yes. chat uh, so everyone can see them as well. Thanks for that. Elise, do you want to take a second or reply when you're ready? Yes. Uh, now I hear you. Thank you very much, uh, Ruli, for your questions. Uh, regarding the first uh, one, uh, this is a big, uh, a big question, especially uh, because uh, we don't, we don't have um, a lot of. Um, so, regarding so the, do you hear me? I, I hear. Yes. Okay. Sorry. So, the spatial and temporal distribution is a big issue uh, because then uh, the question of whether the differences we see is just technological development or, or differentiation of on-site function is really difficult to address. Uh, this can be based, but we need to bring other types of archaeological data, such as uh, the composition of the formal assemblages, or whether there can be similarities in other types of uh, behavior on the data. Um, Regarding the second question, I'm going to read it because I, I haven't uh, heard it. I'm really sorry. Um, Western and Eastern seems favorable, but how is it to some degree? Yes, so the hypothesis is that uh, to explain the differences between the Nile Valley assemblages and the Levantine ones, uh, if we consider that um, uh, that it's a valid sample, even because they are uh, far away samples, but it's just the only samples that uh, are available for this uh, period. Uh, then the hypothesis is that it's completely different uh, worlds, completely different um, uh, social cultural groups, and that even if they were in contact, then they wouldn't completely exchange or, or they wouldn't uh, uh, be ex technological exchange is between these groups, but that would be even reinforced by the fact that there would be some environmental barriers or different lands uh, between between the two. So I agree with your with your uh, hypothesis. Okay, thanks, Elise, and thanks for your questions. Really, um, I believe Marta has their hand up. Marta. <laughs> No, thank you. Thank you for both the talks. So very interesting. I have many questions, but I want one addressed to both of you, and then a little one to Alice on the rock art. Uh, the one to both of you. Both both of you are talking about failed dispersals, and I want to to define to me what you think a failed dispersal is. Yes. If if if. I can start, uh, yeah. Um, then uh, I just, it's failed from a genetic point of view, but I don't think it's failed uh, per se. It's failed because uh, it means that there is as yet not any trace of these dispersals in the genetic data uh, that we have that would have contributed to, um, to current populations. So, Yes, I, I just use it, used yeah. it as uh, as a yeah. yeah. But in a, way, I, yeah. in a way, when we address a, a historical event from an archaeological or historical point of view, whether um, whether that piece of history left living descendants, which is what the, the geneticists might be looking for, uh, is not necessarily our construct of what is success and failure. So if there was a dispersal, and let's say they go, imagine, quote, I have no idea, quote, but imagine that they go and they live in Mexico happily for 5,000 years. Was, was that fair? I mean, even if they didn't live beyond, so certainly the dispersal didn't fail because they got to Mexico, right? And they're sitting there happy, sunbathing. And uh, so the population may not have survived, but then 
no population really survives. I mean, the Mayas at one point collapse. I mean, everybody collapses at one point demographically. The question then is, what is the level of contact, assimilation, continuity, and so on? That may not have happened in that case. But then, even if there were previous uh, dispersal events that led to local populations for a period that do not, in a way, transfer genes to the present, I don't think that makes them failures, necessarily. Sorry. <laughs> so I think that we're getting too much into the genomic vocabulary and there's the questions and vocabularies are different from ours and even a failed a population that leaves no descendant it could have impacted on the environment on other populations which perhaps they have no sex with but it's still or competed or through stones or whatever I, yeah i just want <laughs> a little thought before we talk about the failure of the dispersals in the past and my little, sorry, that was a bit that's of a, a great, that's a great point. That's a great point. We are using genetic terminology and, and yeah, we don't know how long those groups lasted, only that we don't have in our very, 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 very limited genetic sampling, we have not detected their descendants yeah. or, or we have not detected. None. Or maybe they left none. Or maybe they left none, right. Yeah. yeah and it, yeah. It is, it is, it's almost like the, yeah, calling it a failed dispersal is like a value, passing a judgment or something. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we, we need a new term for this. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think, I think one of the reasons I wanted to, one of the things I've taken from looking at the genetic um, data, how it's, it's, we're seeing larger and larger genomic studies through time, but still, uh, insights are coming from only a handful of sites, and uh, the ancient genomics, yes, the ancient and genomics, yeah. The so I think genomics. that's bound to to change as we as sampling in, increases. Yeah, I mean they're super insightful, and I think that for Africa we're all hoping that we'll get more. Um, but it's they also uh, provide us with a simplification of history, which is necessary to model those processes, but. I think that for me, one of the things is separating dispersal, which is uh, not necessarily the same thing as migration, and it's certainly not necessarily the same as the demographic destiny of the populations afterwards. And I think that conflating everything into a single thing is not helping us disentangle what happened. Hmm. Okay, hey, thank you, Marta. That's mini, mini question sorry. on the rock art, at least. <laughs> at least I have no idea about the rock art. I mean, I, I, I love the talk. Uh, what do you make of it? You left it completely floating. <laughs> um, yes, I, I, I found it very, yes, because what I, uh, I, I don't remember if I mentioned it, but it, it it's really, it's destabilizing like to see this level of similarities in regions so far apart and around the same time, just it's how they represented the human. Sahara rock art is very unique. I've never seen, yeah. Yes. So you mean specifically about the human figures that look yeah. like the Magdalenian ones, yeah. yes. Then I I don't know. I, I, I think it's worth uh, further exploring also the the the, the rock art in, Sin in Sinai is not dated so this one we don't know so, but I, I think there is something there that would be worth uh, exploring because of course in this current state of the data it's tempting to say well we it's just like independent it's just by chance but I don't think I don't think it's an interesting hypothesis to to yeah, to investigate and I think reason. maybe yeah I, if Maybe there is something. Is fascinating. If its convergence is fascinating, it's quite yes. exciting. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes, thank you guys. Really fascinating stuff, most definitely. And uh, feel free to continue the conversation after uh, dialogue. But uh, Osama Samawi has been waiting patiently. You have a question? Yeah, about the, 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 the Nile region. Um, you mentioned that uh, the there was dry periods because of due to the Victoria, uh, Lake Victoria, 70,000, I think. 
would you agree that in such conditions with denied fluctuations, that the connections between the two banks, the left and the right banks, were more frequent? The crossing and the yeah, connections and the crossing between the two banks were more frequent. Yes, that would be facilitated, but um, again, I think they would not go. Far, um, I don't think they would go far away from from the from the Nile banks, just for the reason that it it would have been really really hyper arid desert, uh, just a few uh, hundred meters uh, from the Nile. So yes, they would probably there would probably have been. Um, contact between the West and the East Bank. Actually, the late periodic sites are located on both the East and the West. Uh, but um, I think also during the dry season, the Nile was not that wide and was probably crossable even during more uh, humid, uh, humid periods as well. But that's also an interesting, I think, way of uh, thinking of the landscape, like how crossable or uncrossable was the Nile in a West-East uh, axis. I think that's a very interesting question. I agree because most of, most of the studies are focusing like getting out of Africa, but not the small micro movements within there. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Thank you, Osama. And and to build off of that, um, actually, I'm calling in here from Berlin with Roz Gillis, uh, the founder of the Dialogue uh, series. And we were discussing during the talk um, Alice, how would um, changes in the um, in the the Red Sea it, uh, affect uh, the corridors out of Africa, out of Northern Africa, at different time periods? Is that something that uh, we were just thinking? You know, are they taking boats? Is it possible to cross the Red Sea at some point and end up in in what's now Saudi Arabia? Um, thanks. So uh, the Bab the Bab el Mandab was never uh, uh, well the the Red Sea was never closed so it was never possible um, to walk uh, from one way to the other other than via the the Sinai uh, Peninsula so it had if the southern route was uh, used it had to be through uh, navigation. Okay, great, great. And Raz actually had another question for Kurt. Um, about the population expansion in North America. So you showed that after people's arrival um, via or through the ice channel, um, there was an explosion of sites, right? And this is coupled with an increase in ADNA diversity uh, at the same time as this expansion. Do you think that um, groups were more sedentary and having more having more babies and settling in, or do you think something else was going on? Is that fair, Rob? Yep. That's a great question too. Um, I, th I I think I think it's just too tempting to draw the connection between the opening of the of one or both corridors and that that diversification and. They're close enough in time where they must be linked mechanistically, I think. Uh, uh, but then, yeah, um, uh, what about birth rate and uh, you know moving rapidly and 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 how 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 do you get a high birth rate and population expansion when you're when you're racing to South America? And I think um, that's a that's a tricky one too. Todd Suravel has a paper out. Uh, I can't remember what year it came out, showing that um, high mobility and, and high fertility are not necessarily incompatible when, when the subsistence base is, is, is as good as it was for, for that time. Um, and I think, I think we also have to, so I don't think people are getting sedentary exactly, but, or even, or even decreasing mobility, but I think the, the, the compression of events in a relatively small time frame, makes it seem like people are racing to get to the corners of the hemisphere. But when you when you actually look at the amount of time they, that you have to work with and the distance that you have to work with, we're not talking about massive rates of net movement per year. Yeah, um, you're looking at maybe, I, I, I worked this out once and I can't remember what it is, but 
it was very modest. Um, you could do all of your net southward movement in a day or a week and take the rest of the year off. It was really modest amounts of net movement. So I don't think that's incompatible with, with a, higher, um, a higher birth rate. I think it just must have been a bonanza when people were encountering a warming environment. They had incredible access to resources they had never seen before, uh, naive fauna and really, really great abilities. I think it was a recipe for success. They just strapped those babies to their backs and they, they kept moving, eh? That's yeah. great. That's a great idea. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so we're going to wrap things up. We have one more question uh, from Emily Hallinan, uh, and I think it's going to really sum things up. And I think it's for both speakers. Go ahead, Emily. It is. Hi, thanks for great talks. Uh, so I think this kind of will bring the discussion to a close because of the, well, so the question is, do you think that the idea of dispersal corridors really helps us to understand the archeology span of a region or does it just frame somewhere as where people pass through on their way to somewhere else? Is it a problem or is it just sort of how we frame the questions or the scale of inquiry? So yeah, could you maybe wrap up your themes with, with your ideas on this? Kurt, do you want to go first? Okay. Yeah, I think I think for in the in the American case, the dispersal corridors help explain why things move so quickly. Uh, the idea that you don't have to learn a lot of different environments and ecosystems on your way south and wherever. Um, they, I think, as archaeologists or as workers in the area, we get fixed on using this as a a method because we learn it a particular kind of environment really well and we understand its resources and we understand it but we don't necessarily understand the other ones as well um anyway i i don't i don't know if i have a final answer other than i think they are useful but maybe um maybe they're also a way of blinding ourselves to other other possibilities i'll i'll just stop there and let elise chime in Yes, I, I, I completely agree. I think um, I think dispersal, um, dispersal hypotheses have shaped and since even the very beginning, since before uh, the genetic studies saying that they were out of Africa dispersals. Uh, so I think this, this idea of dispersals have shaped how research questions were asked in Northeastern Africa. And I think these are typically the type of questions that are not easily answered based on archaeological data uh, only. And even if they are very interesting and very important to address, um, I think that maybe um, there is a bit of a disconnection about what we can say about arche with archaeological data and the this hypothesis of uh, dispersals. So I would, yeah, maybe that's that's a bit. Um, against the theme of the <laughs> of the dialogue uh, session, but I would say that we need perhaps to be cautious uh, to with this kind of questions using archaeological data, especially in regions like Northeastern Africa that have been really, really studied with this idea of dispersals in mind. No, I think that's a very fair answer. Thank you, Elise. And thank you to both you and Kurt uh, for your excellent talks, uh, which provided a really stimulating and long dialogue. So this has been a great success. Uh, before we let everyone go, I just want to ask you, please don't forget to join us next month on May 27th for our dialogue on migrations and dispersals in the Mesolithic and the Neolithic. It's gonna be convened by Anna Rufa, uh, and it's going to show uh, Rick Schulting of the University of Oxford and Maita Rivola uh, from Ghent University, and they're going to discuss uh, with us again. So I hope we see you there. Thank you guys for your great talk and uh, have a great weekend, everybody.